Okay. We called that sliding mode control. And historically, that was sliding mode control. It was all there was. Once we began to think about um, applying the control signal um, within higher derivatives, we needed to change our terminology. So the controls that we have um, been using up to now, apart from for the EPS, EPS system, are now often called first order sliding modes or classical sliding modes. So that just means we force S to zero and we, it, we design the control by considering S dot. We have said that a disadvantage, certainly for control, not, not for observation, but a disadvantage for control can be the discontinuous nature. Because by looking at S dot, we end up finding U there. So U becomes a function of a sign signal, fundamentally, something that's switching depending on the sign of S. So discontinuity results. Higher order sliding modes, they generalize the concept. So rather than having a switching function S, which we seek to force to zero, we try and make S and some number of higher order derivatives of S equal to zero. So if it was a second order sliding mode, we would try and force S and S dot to zero. And then we would be constructing the control by considering S double dot. Now, the advantage of this is that you move the discontinuity up um, so that the discontinuity is not appearing on you it's appearing in higher, der higher derivatives of S. In fact, it's probably appearing in higher derivatives of U. We can think of it, if you like, as a means to construct a dynamical control. Because we have derivatives of U then in there that depend, um, that depend um, on the sine function. When we construct U, we smooth because it's a dynamical control, okay? So an intuitively nice idea. We push the discontinuity up so that it's not appearing directly on U. It's appearing on higher order derivatives of S, um, and it's coming through so that higher order derivatives of U are a function of the discontinuity. And we seek to try and force all those derivatives, however many we choose, s, s dot, s double dot, up to s r minus 1, to 0. Okay? What we see is, and we mentioned this as well about sampling um, yesterday, particularly in relation to the observer, what we see is if we have a control which is implemented um, with a sample period T, then the accuracy here, the accuracy of the S we get, so in other words, how small it is, varies as P to the R. Okay? So what that is saying is if in a control problem we are sampling, and we are sampling, say, at a rate of 0.1, then S here is going to be of the order of 0.1 in terms of where you can get that boundary around S. But if we uh, used a second order sliding mode, the accuracy we would get of S so how close to zero it would be would vary as 0.1 squared, so 0.01. So we would get greater accuracy. Okay. 
And indeed, one or two of the people who've been um, trying some of the things from yesterday, um, who are interested in very tight tracking, um, it might be a good idea to try a second order sliding mode uh, as well and to see how accurate your tracking is, 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 is for this. So it, it gives us some benefits in terms of accuracy. Um, and we get the um, same robustness property. So we still get um, robustness to matched uncertainty. And we can still get finite time convergence. There are some, some issues with, with, with some of this. Um, the kind of uh, what happens with unmodeled dynamics, for example. Professor Rutkin recently wrote a note, um, I think for the IEEE transactions automatic control, that basically um, showed that for these type of controllers, there could be some issues with unmodeled dynamics that were worse than for um, classical sliding mode control. So it's like I said to you yesterday, you know, we always have to be aware of the positives and negatives. You know, whatever academic comes and talks to you about their method and says it's great, there will be some issues with it. You know, there is nothing that controls everything perfectly. We'd all go home and be out of a job. There'd be no problems, would there? Uh, and people often put this spin on of the good I'm always very anxious with my own PhD students, for example, to say, no, no, we must talk about the good and the not so good, because that makes people make good decisions about whether to use this for particular things or not, um, rather than have, be feel, felt let down when the things have been, you know, this is great, it will do everything, and you apply it and you find some, some, some difficulties. Um, so, the example we used yesterday was a second order uh, sliding mode uh, injection, and we were using it as an observer. We could see, um, uh, we were asked a very good question about whether it could have been, we could have applied a classical first order sliding mode um, injection, and of course we could, because you see, this is just based on S dot, the super twisting algorithm. Okay, so likewise, I could have put a minus k sine s in here and dealt with it in very classical way. So anything the super twisting algorithm does, I can do with a first order sliding mode uh, 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 controller. So what the super twisting algorithm has is you can see why it's dynamic here. So we have... Um, U1 dot here, and we have U2. So in terms of what comes into our plant, it has two elements here, U2, which is a switched term, and U1, which comes from solving this differential equation. So it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a um, Robust, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic um, signal here. So u1 dot is varying with time. We can, and this is how it was formulated in very early papers um, by Ari Levant in uh, Israel, who did a lot of the developments around these types of, of controllers. And you can see immediately that there are quite a lot of things to pick. You know, there is a boundary here in terms of the magnitude of the control that you choose here. There is a boundary here in terms of what the accuracy of your S. There are parameters here which have to be picked depending on boundaries around your um, plant dynamics, effectively. So this will come from the dynamics of your plant, these uh, phi and, and gamma and gamma here. And theoretically, 
it's a very nice idea. Practically, those of us that, that took this and many people who take this um, and, and try and use it, you can fiddle with the parameters um, and you can usually get something good going for a particular simulation. But if you change some conditions, you can find that the performance becomes not so good. So, so it's one of those things that it, we, we have another um, expression in the UK, oven ready. It means a meal you can just take, put in the oven and eat. You don't have to do any work. And we can use it for controllers as well, oven ready. It means that you just take it, apply it, you don't have to do any work. There's nothing to worry about there. No, no bother, it's just ready to use. And the problem with these, these things, is, and, and it goes in when they're used as differentiators as well, is they weren't really oven ready. So if you were there with your application and you were trying to do this, you'd fiddle around, you'd get something that worked, you then change something and something very different would work would happen with your 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 system i think probably because they come from very mathematical arguments so they aren't motivated by physics they do have physical motivation from the point of view of um, you know why we want to switch on higher derivatives but in terms of how the parameters are picked it's much more difficult. I don't know whether any of the people who've applied these sorts of things have, have applied this controller and whether they found it easy to get parameters that work over a range of operating conditions or not. But certainly our experience was that it's quite difficult um, to do. If you look at the example that we considered very extensively as a core example of basic properties throughout the, the program, Look at the scale pendulum where I'm feeding back U is minus Y dot because I know about it. The super twist doesn't tell me to do that. But if I, if I um, don't do that, I, it's much harder to get the super twist to do a nice uh, response. So I feed back on the y, the y dot. I use the super twist to deal with this uncertainty here. Using these set of parameters, I get quite a nice uh, motion into the origin. You can see the three boundaries that we get here. Motion coming in, then a second phase, then a third phase looking very like um, what we had on our, on, our, on our first day. So the super twisting algorithm is one example of a higher order sliding mode controller or indeed higher order sliding mode observer. You can use it um, instead of the solutions to the reachability condition we have met or already and we used it for that observation problem on, um, that we did um, yesterday, the EPS uh, system. Now, one of the areas where um, higher order sliding mode controllers and these ideas of doing things in higher order derivatives become naturally um, interesting is to try and use the ideas to generate derivatives. So if we have a means to exhibit a sliding mode on S equals zero, and S is a difference between a function I've got and, uh, <coughs> a, and a function I'm, um, yeah, a function I know and a function um, that I'm estimating. So you can think, if you like, as F um, as being the signal I have and I'm thinking of constructing an observer in, in, in inverted commas to construct, if you like, an F hat, then I can force a sliding mode on F minus F hat. If I can force higher order sliding modes on S dot, S double dot, effectively, 
I'm forcing sliding modes on the difference between the derivative of the function and what I'm estimating. Okay, so I, I naturally get higher order derivatives. So from taking f minus an estimate of f hat, uh, uh, of f, which we could say call f hat, I can then move to getting f dot as being the derivative of f hat dot, etc. So this was the idea of um, higher order uh, sliding modes to, to provide derivatives. And lots of people want derivatives. It's not just control people. People interested in image processing, they want derivatives. There are lots of applications where people want nice, robust um, derivatives. Now, the one I'm going to talk about is usually called the RED, the Robust Exact Differentiator. That is just the first order case. I'm not going to go into all the ins and outs of the, the higher order sliding mode uh, uh, concepts and do the higher order differentiators. I think you'll see how it could work. Um, the red is pretty well built on the super twisting algorithm, so it, it's more straightforward for us to understand. But our toolbox that we have developed, that toolbox does higher order derivatives. In fact, it does up to order 10. So um, it can estimate up to the tenth derivative of a um, of a signal. So effectively, what the um, we can think of it as a kind of an observer, but now I'm going to call it a differentiator. In fact, I'm going to call it red. This is just the particular case of a first order differentiator. Um, uh, so in terms of getting the first derivative of the signal f, we get an output signal new which exactly coincides with the first derivative of the noise-free input signal. So we, we take f, we use it to as the output to drive our observer, then we end up getting new, which is an estimate of f dot, because we're forcing f dot to zero. Okay? All we need to, to do for this um, is that we need to know that the second derivative with respect to time of the um, input signal we're considering satisfies a, a, a Lipschitz condition, so it's bounded. So we need the second derivative to um, be bounded. And the very interesting thing is that it is robust to uncertainties. So, so long as an f satisfies this inequality here, it's, re it's robust to uncertainties in the input signal. So, these issues of noise, which we talked about quite extensively, we begin to have some means to be able to deal with these problems, um, or, 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 or practical problems. So, all it is, is applying the super twisting algorithm um, as a control law to make sure that we track this thing here, where f is the function I've got, so f is the thing I want the derivative of, my observer is pulling off z0, and I'm using z0 here to drive the sign. So I'm, I'm trying to, to force a sliding mode on f minus z0, and <coughs> also a sliding mode on f dot minus z0 dot, okay? Because in that way, I can use um, z0 dot, if you like, as that, that estimate um, of my signal f. We sometimes use this abbreviation here, um, it, it fundamentally means here that we're dealing with a sign. Um, it makes it slightly less cumbersome for writing it down. So we just this just means f minus z0 to the power b over 2 times the sign of f minus z0. So um, the important thing to note is we've got that discontinuity coming in here. And in this formulation, we've got only two positive constants as tuning parameters, k1 
and K2, except here in my, it's made a mistake here, I've put kappa 0 and kappa 1, so I apologize for that. But you can see here two, um, two tuning parameters here that we, we, need to, uh, we need to select. If we look at the error dynamics between the signal I've got, the S, and the observer I've got, we look like this. So the estimation errors here is the first one, if you like, is just Z0, which gives me the estimate of F, um, the signal I've got, and X1 here, which gives me the difference between the derivative I want to find and Z1, okay, which is the state of my... Um, differentiator. So if I choose my parameters kappa 0 and kappa 1 correctly, what I need to do is to make sure these trajectories here um, go to 0 despite any uncertainty that um, I might have um, that satisfies my Lipschitz condition. So I need to force this particular error dynamics to 0. The big issue, even for this, with um, just uh, doing a first derivative, is this issue of choosing kappa 0 and kappa 1. There are various um, suggestions in the literature. So people have noticed values that work. Okay? And the suggestion in many of the papers is, you know, start with these values, and these values are such that they make your, you, your system stable. They aren't such that they give you nice convergence. Starting from these values, use simulation to try and get better values. So it's like an, an initial condition to start, and then work with these values. But the problem is these values depend on the stability. And so actually tuning these values to get good performance and keeping the system stable is not a, is not a straightforward thing to do. So the motivation for, that Marcus and I had was how to set something up where we could determine a means to keep those parameters stable and yet have a tuning knob to make sure it converge quickly. We noticed this morning, looking at some, um, talking about some results that one of the delegates have been doing, you know, it's clear there is one value that if they make it big, it gives them good performance. That's what somebody doing a design needs. They need to have one knob, they know what to do with that knob, and they need to see it happen. They don't need to have two knobs that if you move them around, suddenly the system goes unstable. So we were looking for that knob to tune that lets you um, tune the parameters of the differentiator. And we wanted to do it for arbitrary order. So we wanted it to work for our toolbox, um, for arbitrary order. Because without that, industry is never going to use it. You know, industry is not going to use something where you, you, you take them something and you say, well, yes, this is a ballpark figure, but you'll need to tweak it. And then they see something happen and they need to tweak it again. You know, this is, this is not the kind of thing they want. They want something robust and, and, and reliable. So our toolbox is all about being able to tune those parameters in the red formulation. And I think what we can say from, from that, so I'm not, I'm not going to do the, the theory. I mean, uh, fundamentally, we use some techniques from pseudo-linear systems, and we show that there are some poles of that system. So going back to the person who asked about poles earlier in the, in, in the program, we show that there are something aligned to poles in, in a pseudo-linear system representation. 
for which we can write down a characteristic equation. And if we ensure the roots of that characteristic equation are real, then there is a, a natural tuning knob that effectively makes all the roots faster. And that's what our toolbox does. So it effectively says these um, higher order sliding mode differentiators, we can think of them as pseudo-linear systems. We can write down um, expressions for a characteristic equation. And we can tune the values of the poles, make them faster or slower with a single knob, which makes the differentiator converge faster or slower. So there's none of this, you know, if I choose these gains this way or that way um, and tweak those gains. Um, and, and you can see why industry was, was struggling with it because fundamentally, if they, you know yourself, let's say if you've got a higher order polynomial, the coefficients of it, if you just start tweaking one parameter within that, there's nothing to say the roots of that are, are going to stay stable. You need to have something that actually keeps all those roots stable. And so that was at the heart of, um, of uh, what we did. So I've given you an introduction to higher order sliding modes and introduced the sliding mode differentiation. I wonder, are there any questions before we go off to start looking at actually what the toolbox does and, um, and, and looking at some problems that we've solved with the toolbox? This is just a differentiator. There's no system. All it's using is a, sing is a signal. So it's using the signal that you want to differentiate. Okay, so it doesn't use any knowledge of the system at all. It just, so if you've got a system with an output and you wanted the output derivative, it is just taking the signal Y. It, there are no dynamics in there, just, just the signal. The pseudo-linear system relates to the, the pseudo-linear system relates to this, the dynamics of the differentiator. So it's the dynamics of the differentiator which are fixed. And again, in higher order, you know, we, I haven't because the mathematics here is fairly heavy. If we start talking of arbitrary order differentiators, I just thought it wasn't the appropriate, <laughs> you know, step, step, step change. But that, you can express as a pseudo-linear system. And that is the step we, we, we use. Do we have any other questions? Okay, I will put my, my other slides up. So here I'm going to talk through, we, we presented our toolbox, it, it, we made it available on ResearchGate when it was developed, um, and we, um, and it can be downloaded there as well as the downloads I've given you. Um, it, um, we did a, a presentation um, at the IFAC World Congress, so that's Marcus, my um, close collaborator from Technical University of Graz, obviously myself. Our two co-authors here are from industry. So um, we thought it was a good idea to have industry involved in the development of the toolbox and for them to be applying it to their, their systems and working with us on the toolbox. So it's a co-authored uh, piece of work, which is ourselves as the academics, but also to, um, to industrialists. And the toolbox is effectively a block here, okay? So, the, sorry, yeah, so 
Effectively, what it is, is a simulink block. Okay? And nothing could be easier. Um, in here, you feed the signal that you want to be differentiated. In here, you set up a number of parameters, which are very simple parameters. One parameter, which um, relates to what order of differentiator do you want? How many derivatives do you want? Second parameter, which relates, if you like, to this tuning knob, speed of response. And then two things come out. One is the derivative of the signal coming in here. Okay, so the derivatives come out. And also coming out is that sliding mode, that measure of accuracy, to make sure for the F we've got, this is actually producing an accurate estimate of the original F. Because if it isn't, then our derivatives are questionable. So it, we, we look effectively at that um, sliding mode. And we can also see how rapidly it's, it's attained. And it's pretty easy to use. I had an undergraduate student, uh, one of my project students this year. So he arrived um, in um, late September to start his uh, um, third year of his MEng, so a bit like an MTech. Um, and they do a project in there. I gave him the toolbox. He never met sliding modes, so he knew nothing about sliding modes. He'd done a second year control course. Within a week, he could use this differentiating signals, um, plotting in MATLAB. So, you know, it is it's not, 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 not challenging to use, even though, and this is why we've done it like this, because, of course, it hides quite a lot with all the pseudo-linear systems and the... Uh, the uh, uh, I'm sure if we tried to sell it on the basis of that characteristic polynomial, we'd have got nowhere with industry. But because we've got a nice kind of uh, means of doing it, and nobody has to worry much, and uh, it's, it's actually working very nicely, um, it, it makes it straight straightforward. So, as has been rather nicely summarized here, the, our whole drive of this very current and, and leading edge work is to make the robust exact differentiator more accessible for the real world. So to take it away from these highly mathematical papers, which are, are generally quite difficult to read um, and difficult for people to, uh, to, to use. And it comes in here in the simulation stage. So we know that for your system, you're wanting to design feedback loops. You've got modeling, controllers, observers, estimators. You, you do simulation, um, and you then generate code for implementation that takes you into the real world. And this is the, the industri our industrial partners, this is one of their their rigs that we'll see, see the results for uh, later. So we want to get things into the real world very, very easily using tools. And our differentiator block sits there as a simulation tool that can be used um, within this design loop. So, Effectively, what we're saying is we've got this. So you can think of the observer problem. As I say, no dynamics. We're not worried. And indeed, this F might not have come from dynamics. If you're, some people using this are using it from the point of view of signal processing and um, image recognition and edge detection and things like that. And so for them, there is no dynamics. They just have signals and they want to find derivatives. So we have a signal, and we're wanting to construct some derivatives. And we can choose how many derivatives we pick. So we can write this system down in this way. Um, we saw for our... Um,
our second order um, super twisting algorithm, we needed the second derivative to be um, Lipschitz, to be bounded. In general, if we're dealing with a, a signal where we're interested in the nth derivative, so we're interested in the nth derivative, we need the n plus 1 derivative to have that bound. Okay? So, we can define just as we did for um, the very simple first order, uh, uh, yeah, for the very simple first derivative uh, uh, estimation. We can, desire, we can define um, a general, that, that system in terms of a, a, a general nth derivative in just the same way. So that's just expanding out if we look um, for i going from 0 to n, we will um, get um, the, um, a family, you know, rather than just the, the two layers we, we had before. We know we're going to get some error dynamics, and it's clearly those error dynamics that give us the derivatives. So forcing those error dynamics to zero gives us the derivatives. So these error dynamics look like this. We can see that we've got everywhere things involving the sign of x0, okay? where x0 is our original error. So the, uh, uh, um, the error between the original signal and the estimate of it, which of course we have. Okay? So it is not difficult to um, force those dynamics to zero in theory, in theory. We talked a little bit about sampling um, yesterday and recognizing that if you're going to do this, we need to sample our system here. Um, you know, if we've got an F, it's going to be a sampled F more often than not. It's not going to be a continuous F. And so what we uh, uh, did, and, and really as a bit of a motivation for some of the work I know you're going to do with SOAM tomorrow, we actually used a discrete time implementation, which makes sense, um, I think. So for our discrete time differentiator, we use very simple Euler discretization. It's perhaps a good moment to step back and talk about the simulations. Various people have asked me about how you would set up the parameters. Typically, when using Simulink to run simulations for um, systems that involve sliding mode controllers and sliding mode observers, and I would always urge you to use a fixed step. And I would urge you to use something simple like Euler discretization as we you, you used here. Um, A, you have more, you know what's happening. You've got to bear in mind, certainly when we're looking at, at some of these higher order algorithms, just looking at the super twisting, you can see it's pretty complicated and it involves sinusoids. You've got to be really careful that your integration routine, your numerical integrator, is not um, trying to respond in unwanted ways. You know, we want things to switch. The instinct of most variable step solvers is to see change and, you know, push down the time step to try and stop it. Okay, they. You know, for them, that's a, a, a kind of a, a mark of potential instability. So we want things to be able to switch. So we've used Euler here. I would encourage you to use Euler in your, um, in your um, simulation for anything involving uh, uh, um, observers or controllers. And I would say do the ACID test in terms of is the step size small enough, um, do the acid test, which t 
typically we do, um, which is to try your, get, get some results for what you think is a reasonable step um, in your MATLAB integrator, and then make it fractionally smaller and check there is no change in your results. Very easy thing to do. Best to go through that step, though, because sometimes, you know, if you haven't got a small enough step, you've got a very um, complicated and maybe uh, uh, ill-conditioned system. You can be trying to control it in a way that's not going to work because it's just a function of your, of your integrator. So Euler is the order of the day, and we used very simple Euler discretized chain of integrators. So very, very simple. You then get a discrete error here. Um, and you can implement your discrete time differentiator. So we haven't adjusted the super twisting type algorithm at all. We're still using that super twisting type algorithm in exactly the same way as we were for the case of the red, but um, we have just implemented it discreetly. Interestingly, after that, there was um, a, a paper um, has come out um, which supports doing this. So we have followed this proper discretization of homogeneous differentiators. Um, initially, we just did it in a classical engineering type approach, um, but now there are, are better ways of uh, uh, doing this. Again, this is a very mathematical paper with all sorts of proofs, um, but um, at the heart is a, a, a quite straightforward um, implementation. And we put this here, this thing in the red box, is actually what's in our differentiator block. So at the heart of this, is this n plus one order system, which can go up to order 10. After order 10, the problem with order 10, um, uh, once you start going up to very high orders, what you find is the accuracy of the machine. There's nothing wrong with our parameters. We can tune parameters for a 20th order differentiator. The problem is the accuracy of the computer. You start to hit the limits because you're doing t, t squared, t to the 20. You can see you're, you're hitting the accuracy of your typical computer. So up to about 10, you're OK. At 10, you do see there has been a paper about um, um, accuracy of computers that kind of says don't go much more over 6. Um, because at six you will lose a bit of accuracy because of the, uh, you know, the um, uh, accuracy of a typical PC. Um, <coughs> but that is the limit. It's not. It's not the theory that limits it. It's it's the it's the um, it's the accuracy of computers. And I'm sure that will change. Who knows? With quantum computing, we should be computing derivatives um, to very high orders. You might ask why we want to, and I think it's an interesting point here. Um, if I ask you to compute a first order derivative, would you think it strange if I used a fifth order differentiator? Yes, because it sounds strange, doesn't it, you think? One derivative? Why don't I just compute it? Well, if we think about what we know about the accuracy, the accuracy goes up with the order of the differentiator. So if I want a good first derivative, I can use a higher order differentiator. I won't need those higher order derivatives 
but my first order derivative will be more accurate than if I just used a first order one because the accuracy is going up as t to the r if you, we saw from the higher order sliding mode control argument. So this is an interesting point and this toolbox makes this much easier to do because previously even for the red people were struggling to find two parameters to keep their derivative good over a range of operations. If you'd told them let's up the order to five or six they'd have gone no. For six in the literature there were prior to our work there were no even starting sets of parameters just to stabilize it. People couldn't stabilize the six order one. Okay. So people couldn't use higher order differentiators even though it's a more accurate thing to do. But now with the toolbox we can. And it's a useful tip because you'll get a more accurate derivative if you use a higher order differentiator than you actually need. Okay, so I would definitely, we couldn't believe it the first time we did it. That I won't present the results here. There won't be an experiment that I've presented. This was a purely lab experiment. But I spent some time at Technical University Graz. And one of the students there who was studying for a PhD had been working um, with a, a levitated ball. So uh, levitated ball experiments. And he was using a Kármán filter to construct a derivative. And it was working okay. And, and we had the measurement, so for him, he knew what, he, what his estimate was, and he knew uh, what the signal was as well. And we applied our differentiator offline, you know, because you, we could look at the data. And we used a higher order differentiator to estimate, and we couldn't believe how good it was. Initially, we thought it must be a mistake. It was so good. You know, you looked at it, you thought, gosh, you can't possibly take real experimental results and get that accuracy of estimation of a first order derivative. But you can if you use that higher order differentiator. So that's a tip for anyone who's working with practical problems and wants to try and use this. Um, definitely try and use that um, high, higher order um, differentiator. So here it is, it needs some sort of signal to come in, which will typically be a measurement from a process or a set of data. But in terms of the um, setting up the toolbox, we have um, usually done um, examples with um, the source blocks from Simulink, so we use a sine wave. As I said, we have two outputs, the convergence which is just like s yesterday. You know, all the time we're looking at s equals zero. That's what that is. You want that to be zero and going to zero quite quickly. Okay? Because that means it's converged. And then here we have coming out the derivatives. It's difficult to, 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 to see on, on the slides, um, but the, the, it's just like a proper simulink block for our S function here, you um, put the order of the differentiator. So here we put two. And then we put in this convergent rate, which we've called a robustness factor, real positive number. That is just moving those poles further into the left half plane. So positive means they're in the left half plane. Okay? So you can't, if you put it negative, I think it probably won't let you. But even if you put it negative, you're making something with it, you're ma making it diverge. By making it more and more positive, effectively what you're doing is pushing a set of, albeit nonlinear poles, further and further into the left half plane. So intuitively obvious what it's doing. It's just making the system faster and faster, and hence increasing the robustness. Because, of course, as soon as we've got down to zero, um, that's when we're going to get our um, differentiator. So, convergence is shown here. You can't see it. Um, I can barely see it here, but you, because it's a, a simulink scope, and I think it probably isn't quite, uh, you know, there's the something to do with the resolution. But you can see we're wanting it to be zero. Okay? We're wanting it to be zero for this 
uh, case. And then if we could see it here, we would see the derivatives of the sine wave coming out. So we would see the sine wave coming out. Now what I'm going to focus for the next bit of the lecture is on um, two case studies, two examples where we used it. But before I do that, I wanted to check whether there are any kind of comments or questions on this uh, issue of the uh, uh, differentiator and th this whole idea of having this toolbox. Yes. 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 In doing it. No, this is really quick. I mean, if you think in terms of the kind of um, what we've got at the heart of this, it is just what we had yesterday when we were doing our simple um, MATLAB simulation. It's a couple of lines. So for these examples where we're doing, um, we will actually be implementing in real time. We, and we have done it by downloading um, from Simulink onto hardware which we know is not the most efficient way of, of doing it. We know that Simulink puts all sorts of general things in and makes big implementations and then whatever we do fits with, within this. I know that from my work um, and the work of my students with industry on other things. And indeed, some of the work we're doing with the automotive industry at the moment, that the efficiency of the code is highly important. Now, me, that's not my skill um, uh, in terms of the efficiency of the code. But there is nothing to say that this is not good enough for those, for, for those environments. As I say, it, it even works well with the kind of um, overhead of doing this kind of download from Simulink. Um, it's not uh, a hugely cumbersome um, algorithm that has a massive overhead. It's, it's oily, it's fixed step. It's, um... Yes, this will be with it downloaded on the hardware. This is taken from our toolbox, downloading it onto the hardware. I mean, there are commercial ways of doing this, which is DSpace. DSpace is what my lab have used. Marcus um, doesn't use DSpace, but they have other ways. I think they use more National Instruments type stuff to, to download it. Um, there are many ways of doing this for prototyping. And all these results, including the EPS results yesterday, these were all done by those methods. I'm sure that isn't how industry would implement, though. Um, as I say, it's not my expertise but the, uh, in terms of efficient code. But I do think that doing those downloads, there may be people here much better um, able to comment on this than me, but um, that, that those downloads don't make efficient code. They make working code that's good for testing, but it's not as efficient as you would want if it was just the thing you were putting on your car that was going out onto the, the production line. Um, but you, and so you could make it even more efficient is what I'm saying. But it certainly can be used and all of ours has been used downloading directly onto hardware. Yes, yes. Well, the, um, yes, with the, the digital form of the differentiator was what um, was this here. That is a digital form. This is, no, this is in the toolbox. This is in the toolbox. So the digital form is in the toolbox. So it's done digitally. Um, for that reason, really. It's much more straightforward. Because as soon as you make a toolbox, as soon as you make a block and give it to people, you want to limit what they can do with it. And because with continuous time, not for a bad reason, but just that if there is, you know, if there is a lot of flexibility. So if we've done this in continuous time and sent it out as a block, 
people could have done things by just using the wrong integrator, for example, and got funny things happening just because they were using the wrong integrator. Whereas because it's discrete, we've prevented that, um, we've prevented that step. The initial values. I mean, the initial values are not a, uh, I mean, they don't matter. You have to put some sort of, in, it puts some sort of initial values. I don't think you're even asked to put initial values in. Um, you clearly know what the signal is initially. So, you know, so you know what F is. So you can set its estimate um, to be what the signal is. I strongly suspect for all the others, we probably initialize them at zero. The initial condition doesn't matter because it's evolving with these stable poles. So by initial condition, it will come to zero. By tuning that parameter, the robustness parameter to make it fast, you can make it faster. So the initial condition is, 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 not, is not an issue for it. And you don't have to pick it anyway. As we saw in the toolbox here, the initial condition is not something you pick. Um, yes, but in, in theory, but um, in practice, if you know a signal value, you, you have no idea of what its derivative look like. Um, and so it would be less compelling if we had to know what, 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 what they were. Typically, when we did testing, we did lots of, before we built the toolbox, I spent some sabbatical time at Bratz, and before we built the toolbox, we did lots and lots of te um, testing, and we just used to use the random number generator to do the initial conditions on the argument that this was likely, you know, if you've got real signals, they're going to be highly variable, the initial conditions, and so we need to be able to cope with the range of initial conditions. Yes. Yes, yes. Well, so if you've got noise, and we will see that, I mean, it, the accuracy varies as t squared, and so that means you get some noise attenuation. So again, the higher... Or, this is why your derivatives are better estimates. A first derivative is a better estimate with a higher order... Um, differentiator because it's attenuating the noise to a higher degree. Yep. Yes. All of them, yeah. But I would just use, yeah, and if you only want the first one, clearly you just use a mux block to put a demux just to pull that off and use it in your, your controller. But for noise, it will be better. So you will get more accuracy by using a higher order differentiator, even if you only want the first derivative. Yep. Yep. That will, well, it will be it will be freer, it won't be noise free, it will be better, it will have better performance to, to the same noise than if you tried to get it with the second order differentiator. You, with the toolbox, you can do the test. You can put in a noisy signal um, and you can tr look at the first derivative from get, using a first, second, third, or fourth, fifth, and you should see Push, pushing down, pushing down on the accuracy every time. But it won't be zero. I mean, in the limit, you need an infinite order differentiator to get zero. There will be a slight computational overhead, but I would say nothing towards the accuracy you get. I mean, as I say, we were doing it, 
And in the end, we controlled off it. So we were controlling um, the levitated ball, which is, needs pretty fast response. And we were using a six-order differentiator to get the velocity of the ball with a levitated ball. If we'd have had a problem, uh, such as the problems you're talking about, which I agree an important thing to consider, if there'd been a problem with the additional computational time, the ball would have fallen. You know, that's a difficult system to be able to uh, maintain that ball there. You have to have very fast um, sampling and, and responsive control. Otherwise, as we know, it, it falls. Well, that, that you know, that is a technical issue. That if it's very, uh, if it is very noisy, then it might be violating the Lipschitz condition. Yes, yeah, it's true. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So has that answered the questions? Everyone feels comfortable with what what we're trying to do. And hopefully that you can try it with your own, um, your own systems. Lots of people are, and we're not having lots of hassle. I think we have more than 200 users. So um, uh, it, it seems to work very well. So it should work. You've had the benefit. It would make me feel really bad if you can't use it because other people have just been using it off ResearchGate with no interaction um, at all. So um, let's go back. Oh, yeah, here it is. So... These um, uh, industrial collaborators are from the automotive industry, um, and um, they were interested in effectively suppression of oscillations in the drivetrain. So a real system, you can see it here, here, and... Um, Fundamentally, what they want to do with their controller, and we're not designing the controller, we're just giving information to the controller, is to reduce oscillations of this elastic shaft. They have an active damping strategy. So they use active damping to, um, to um, attenuate these um, um, oscillations. They have... Um, a very simple, again, uh, model of the dynamics of the shaft, um, which we can see is a simple second-order um, system here. And they can measure the shaft torque. Their active damping strategy is, is, is shown uh, here. And fundamentally, what they need to do is to have some idea of this, PS. Because if they, don't, if they can't feed back what's happening here, then they can't, do, they can't implement their damping strategy. So this is their strategy where effectively they've got a derivative here. So in the feedback path here, they have got a derivative that they wish to construct in order to implement the strategy. So I'm not here to defend the strategy or look at the controller. We were just asked or given the opportunity to use our MATLAB toolbox to construct this derivative here to see what happened. And the beauty of it was that they have a, a re real rig. So they have real rig, lots of experiments, and have used lots of other ways to try and estimate um, this um, derivative. So, um, we are giving them, if you like, indirectly the TD that comes in to their control signal, and it's coming in as a function of our differentiator. It, 
if we can do this, we can then eliminate, hopefully, the impact of the drivetrain um, oscillations, or at least atten attenuate them. Going back to what we said about choosing a higher order differentiator, we only need one order here, but we used a fourth order. So we used fourth order, where we were just going to use the first derivative. So we were going to throw away the second, third, fourth derivative, but we used that because that enabled us to get a more accurate um, approximation. The convergence uh, rate we used here was 350, so quite large. You'd expect, just looking at that machine, that it's, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty and all sorts of uh, uh, things coming into play that are going to feed back onto that signal. Um, and you can see that the step size they could uh, give us is one millisecond. So that's the step size that uh, they had in their existing um, implementation. So if we have a look, we've got two things here. The first, well, three actually. The first things here is the blue line is what the drivetrain does if you don't have that feedback path in there at all. So if you let the drivetrain oscillate. And you can see here, blue line here, you can see that in terms of the torque and the speed, you can see the blue line coming out here. Their current implementation used suppression with linear differentiation. So they basically used um, a sort of Euler type uh, method, just as we would use to um, estimate or solve a differential equation. They used uh, that to um, do linear differentiation here. Okay? And that gives you the green line here. Okay? And then the red line was when they replaced the linear differentiator we've got there with the toolbox um, and we see we get far more consistent performance here. It's not, it's not, it's not completely uh, taken the uh, um, elastic uh, vibrations out, out of there, and you know one could argue that just as that as a simple control method of just attenuating in that method, you know, just as the control method is, is never going to be able to take everything out. But certainly you get much more consistency here. So the, the um, line that we get here doesn't have this, you know, popping out and coming back as the um, oscillations burst out and then, then come, back, um, come back in. And it's well within the blue, and it certainly looks nicely within the green. It's interesting to look at um, these simulation results here, which show what happens to the amplitude of the torque. So without suppression, we can see the amplitude of the torque rises up to nearly 1,500, so at least 1,400 here. When you do suppression with the linear differentiator, it actually suppresses the amplitude, um, but there's a frequency shift, so it, shift, it moves it. Whereas the robust exact differentiator keeps it much closer in terms of frequency to where it was before and reduces it by a little bit more. So the reduction is not huge by any stretch of the imagination, um, but it maintains it here at uh, its, um, the same sort of uh, frequency. Here's some experimental results. So this is our, um, the real system. Um, we can see here the measured shaft torque coming as the blue line. The robust exact differentiator is 
the red line here, the linear differentiator uh, <coughs> is the black line, and a tuned linear differentiator is the green line. So the robust exact differentiator, just as it was with those parameters we set as the 350, managed to do a pretty good job. The linear differentiator, when it was applied, as was from the simulation, didn't do such a good job um, by itself. It needed to have further tuning. So that is a benefit. It's a benefit if we can take something from simulation and we directly download it onto hardware and it does what it did in the simulation. Another application that we did was looking at reconstruction of acceleration or edge detection. It's the same type of application. Um, we'll show it, in fact, um, as, a, as an edge de detection, um, act, acting as an edge detector. Um, again, just using the toolbox on an example from the literature relating to image processing. Acceleration is an interesting one. We know for robotics, for example, that constructing acceleration it can be a, a very good thing um, to do. And in fact, the student I mentioned to you, my undergrad, I've got him using the toolbox to try and um, see how well we do in relation to signals that have come off a KUKA robots in China um, that as used for their controllers to see um, how well this can do at constructing the derivatives, how closely they'll come to the ones that KUKA commercially um, are, are generating. So... Um, in uh, this case, we have a differentiator of order three. So first of all, um, we have uh, a measured acceleration. We're only using the differentiator order that's going to give us the, um, the acceleration. We haven't increased it here. Quite a small um, convergence rate. Um, uh, robustness factor 13. It's not a highly uncertain uh, system. There's not going to be a lot of noise. Otherwise, we probably would have upped the order. And again, the step size is one millisecond. And we can do that very well uh, indeed. A further application is edge detection. Again, you don't see that terribly well. Um, it's, the, um, it's the symbol from the Technical University of Graz. You know, we always have our logos. So this is trying to detect the edges of the Technical University of Graz logo. We used a differentiator of order two, robustness factor of 1.6, step size of one. So lots of examples where we're getting good results. And one thing we're really interested in knowing about, because we're developing this, I'm actually going to be spending some time working with Marcus in December, so this is an ongoing project for us. We're really interested in how people get on with this. So we're interested in feedback. If you use it, did it work? How easy was it to work? So we would like you to engage with us on developing this toolbox. So giving some feedbacks if you go away and try it, particularly if you're trying it on real examples um, and real physical systems, this would, be, this would be great. So at the cutting edge, we have an, an implementation of a sliding mode-based differentiator where it's seeking to be a bridge, a bridge from this really theoretical work that's happened in the sliding mode community, very high quality work that's really quite difficult to put in the lab and to get something that you can just download, use, you know, within a day you're able to download onto your hardware and implement onto your systems. 
So we're building a bridge and we have a number of examples demonstrating the application of the toolbox. Um, we're going to have a new release soon with some more novel discretization. Um, we're doing a lot more applications. There are several here. I thought this was good. Um, this is parameters. Gives you some idea of parameters for the, the, for the toolbox. You can tell why the people who were trying to do it by trial and error were not able to find the parameters. Okay, when you look at what you get from doing it analytically through a set of polls, the kind of things that we get um, is, is, is not going to be something you're readily going to, you're going to have to spend a lot of time trial and erroring to, to come up with, uh, with, with some of those. So we think we've got a nice solution. I hope you'll find it useful. I really hope you'll try it. Because it's, you know, it doesn't matter how complex the system is. Um, um, here we're at the level of dealing with signals in a system. Um, there's no design freedom for you other than one parameter. And you get, a, you get a plot which shows how fast is that going to zero. If it's not going to zero very fast, you just make it bigger. And that's all you have to do. Okay, so I don't know if there's any more questions on this. Well, the convergence rate, I mean, the convergence rate is, is just effectively um, a multiplier of the poles of that pseudo-linear system. Now, we don't, we don't, tell people that because I think if you're an average industrialist we told them it was a you know it's not necessary for them to know and it might make it seem you know hard and difficult to do so we have hidden that in the toolbox but fundamentally what it is is the parameter which scales the poles of those systems and it makes them faster and you can find that you can scale all the poles by a single number. Sorry? It is, well, if we wanted to compute it, it effectively relates to the speed of those poles. So it's how big, and it's, it's fundamentally making sure that that is big enough to um, ensure the Lipschitz condition is, is, is satisfied. That's another way of thinking about it as well. So, you know, there's two things that you're doing with that parameter. You are making the poles sufficiently fast and you can show that the fastest pole, um, if you like, needs to be, sorry, the slowest pole needs to be bigger than your Lipschitz condition. So there is a, a relationship between the Lipschitz condition and the speeds of the, these poles. So part of it is making it robust, but another thing is in terms of performance. Yes. Well, in terms of controller design, there may be, but for a differentiator, it's much easier because all you're wanting to do is find the derivative. Um, and we want to find, it's a bit like for the difference between the controller and the observer. All we want to do is to find it as fast as possible. We want it to converge as quickly as possible. And we want to drive something to zero. That's our only performance. And we have no limits like control input limit or anything like that because it's an observer. Effectively, it's observing a derivative. Sorry? There's a frequency shift in what they had, yes. I mean, that's not mine. That, that, that was the industry people. You know, they were just try, they were trying our differentiator to see how it worked. 
Um, so we didn't decide, they, they use a linear differentiator, they use a linear differentiator at the moment. So we just wanted to see how well it works. I don't know. Okay. I'd have to look into the details of that. I can't tell you. All. I just know that people that do edge detection, if you've got an image, which is effectively an F, you need to find the acceleration in order to do the um, edge detection. So again, we were just, you know, I'm not saying that uh, my interest is in edge detection, a bit like this, this, this shaft problem. It's not my controller. That's not my problem. My, the only bit I did, or we did, was we gave them the second derivative. Okay. Um, so, you know, I'm not in a position to say whether how you do the edge detection is a... We just took um, a, a paper from the... And, and quite a well-cited paper from the literature where they were doing signal processing to do edge detection and were signal processing a derivative. And at that step, we used our differentiator block and everything else that they did stayed exactly the same. To see if it could get, we could get good edge detection. Okay, well, I think we should have our tea break now, and uh, I will see you at half past eleven.